What's the most important thing that we can do to secure peace and prosperity for the people of Northern Ireland? In my view, it's about addressing mental health and the trauma-related needs of our population. I've been doing this stuff for over 20 years now, researching psychology and mental illness and suicide. And in 2005, I conducted with two colleagues, Sam Murphy and Brendan Bunting, the Northern Ireland Study of Health and Stress. Now, this was the biggest study of mental illness ever in Northern Ireland. And we asked people about the symptoms of mental illness. Um, the study was conducted in over 30 countries around the world. We also asked people about things that had happened to them across their lifespan. And that study found that four in 10 people in Northern Ireland had witnessed or experienced a traumatic event relating to the Northern Ireland Troubles. That was really, really shocking. We're talking here about atrocities, bombings, shootings, riots, seeing dead bodies, really serious things to encounter. And it equated to 610,000 people across the population, and my own mother was one of them. In 1972, two years before I was born, three bombs ripped the heart out of our small community and killed nine people. My mother was there on that day, and when the first bomb went off, she fled to safety, and she survived, and, and I was born. But another two bombs went off, and she witnessed the aftermath, and it stayed with her. Whenever we're in a situation like that, when we're in grave danger, the body does some amazing things, it's the science but no. Um, the acute stress response happens. Our brain registers that there's a fear, that there's, that there's something wrong, that we're in danger, and the body reacts. And this is known as the fight or flight response or the acute stress response. And it happens without us having really to do very much. It just happens with one single thought. And it affects all the systems of the body. It prepares the body to fight an aggressor or run away. And it works really, really well, depending on the type of aggressor that we have. But if it's activated too frequently over time, it can cause us problems. And this has evolved over centuries to protect us because our ancestors who had this were able to fight the enemies. And the people who were calm didn't survive. They didn't have babies. Those calm, peaceful mind genes didn't get passed on to the next generation. However, nowadays we live in a very, very different world where the threats are not so much physical, like this. They're more psychological in nature. Bereavement, loss, separation, the darkness of depression, the pain of poverty, work conflict, bullying, exam stress. These are not situations where fighting or running away will serve us well. We need to be calm and we need to work things out in a peaceful way. But we are left with this response. And every time we endure a stressor, it's activated. And as I said, there can be problems if it happens too much, and post-traumatic stress disorder is one of those problems that we can have. PTSD is characterized by three clusters of symptoms. The first one is around that original trauma, and the person re-experiences a traumatic event where they felt that they were in danger and under threat in a way that's obtrusive in the form of flashbacks and nightmares. And they can be triggered by the least little thing, a sight, a sound, a smell, a thought, an emotion. And it's not like a normal memory. This can happen when the person is least expecting it. And it's, it's absolutely terrifying. It's as if they're right back there. And the body responds physiologically in the same way. And people who have these experiences will do anything to avoid them, and they engage in a whole range of avoidance behaviors. They rearrange their lives so that they don't have to do anything that will make them think or feel or react or remind them of that traumatic event. They shut themselves off, often from their families, often from people who love them, and they, they can't feel emotions. They close themselves down, and people with PTSD talk about how they can't feel emotions like love. It's a devastating illness. The third cluster of symptoms is hypervigilance, and this is when the acute stress response has been activated so frequently that the body actually believes it's a constant state of high alert. There's danger everywhere. And the, the trigger for that acute stress response is moved down a notch. 
And people with PTSD can have angry outbursts. It can result in violence through no fault of their own. It's just the way their body's responding. And it can be really, really difficult to live in a family where somebody has PTSD. In our study, we found that 9% of the population met the criteria for this mental illness through the course of their lifespan. And of the 30 countries that were involved in the World Mental Health Surveys, Northern Ireland was number one for PTSD. PTSD is actually a treatable mental illness. There are lots of therapies out there that effectively rewire the brain and allow people to make sense and make meaning from what happened and move on and get their lives back. But the problem is people don't ask for help. Because of that avoidance cluster of symptoms, they're not willing to come forward and talk about what happened, particularly if it's related to something like the Northern Ireland conflict. There's so many issues at play there. And in our study, we found that the average duration between the first onset of symptoms of PTSD and help-seeking behaviour was 22 years. And that was astounding. We were also interested in how the overall population fared out so that we could make comments about what sort of services were needed and, and we could plan for the future. And this was what we found when we crunched our numbers. 71% of the population did really well, were at low risk for mental illness. Um, and these included many, many people who'd witnessed and experienced conflict-related traumatic events. Somehow they were resilient and many went on to flourish as a result of what had happened to them. And we can see these people everywhere, they're peacemakers and peacekeepers. Post-traumatic growth is something that we need to know more about in Northern Ireland because it's happening all around us. The other group can be divided up into two sections. In that gold group, the 14.6%, we have the people who in any population will be at high risk of having a mental illness. And that's because of what has happened to them in their childhood. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, are the biggest risk factor for mental illness that we know about. And ACEs, or childhood adversities, result in the activation of that fight or flight response repeatedly at a time when that child's brains and bodies are growing rapidly. The first three years are a time of neuroplasticity and the child's brain grows from 20% to 80% of its adult size. Neurons are firing together and wiring together at a rate of one million per second. If the fight or flight response is activated too frequently during that period, if the child is in a situation where there's toxic stress, then their brains will be wired for fear and danger their stress response will be lowered and they will become more hypervigilant. The structures in the brain change. And that, of course, not only increases their risk of mental illness throughout their lifetime, but also affects their prospects, their educational outcomes, their prospects in the workplace. The other group that we have here, the red and orange group, are people who've also had childhood adversities, but on top of that, they've had conflict-related traumatic events. And what differentiates that group from the blue group is their use of alcohol and substances. And we know that alcohol was a way that we had here in Northern Ireland of dealing with the traumas that we witnessed that we couldn't talk about. That little red group, that 4.3%, those are a group of people who've had ACEs and conflict-related trauma exposures and also multiple traumatic events. And that group in Northern Ireland had over 15 times the risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviours as that blue group. We know that during the Northern Ireland Troubles, the suicide rates were actually lower. It seems that so that, that the conflict gave people who may have otherwise been suicidal, who may have felt hopeless and marginalised, it gave them a sense of purpose, a reason, a reason for them to fight, a reason for them to live. They knew what it was all about. When the troubles ended, many people struggled to make sense of what all that fighting was about and what had been achieved by that. And the suicide rates went up. And being exposed to all that pain and violence is known to habituate us it numbs us to the effects of pain and makes us more likely to be able to act with violence against ourselves. If we live in a world where there's lots of death around us, 
suicide becomes more common in those groups. Now, 10 years after the original study, I was contacted by a journalist, Lyra McKee. And Lyra wanted to understand why the rates of suicide were so high in young people in Northern Ireland, people who had not known the violence of the Troubles. And so I explained to Lyra that living in an environment, in a community, in a family where people had trauma-related mental illnesses resulted in ACEs for, for that next generation. And it wasn't the fault of the communities, it was just a result, a natural biological result of what had happened. But it creates adversities for those children. And th that trauma in, in the previous generation is passed on to the next generation in a different form. And then Lyra asked me about my own experiences. Had I been affected by the troubles? And of course, I said with confidence, no, that, well, my mother might have witnessed the Claudie bombing, but we never got involved in that sort of thing, and we didn't talk very much about it. We kind of moved on. And Lyra looked up from her hot chocolate, and, and then I realized that, of course, I'd been affected. We had all been affected, every single one of us, and that we needed to do something about that. So, well, what do we need? Well, well, what we don't need is more awareness, particularly around suicide. We have a generation of young people for whom suicide is an option because they know so much about it. We need to be so careful about how we talk about this stuff. It is an alternative. It is out there as something that people do, and that's not acceptable. What we do need is an understanding of the impact of trauma, particularly trauma in young people. And we need to resource and finance those individuals who have responsibility for our children's developing brains. We need to be trauma-informed, in other words. And we need to know that when children display behaviour that we previously labelled as bad, and even children that we labelled as bad, that that's just a biological reaction to adversity and stress, and that that can be reversed, particularly if we intervene early, if we get in there early and do something about that. We need to teach young people metacognition. We need to teach people how to use the most important part of their body, their brain. And we need to teach people how to be resilient, and we need to, te we need to teach hope. And these are things that can be taught. We can teach people how to cope in stressful situations, particularly if we get in there early. And finally, of course, we need to treat mental illness, and we need to provide therapies for people who have suffered as a result of the conflict, and for people who are suicidal, because there's lots that we know we can do nowadays. Of course, Lyra herself was killed, murdered, whilst witnessing another impact of transgenerational trauma, street violence, rioting. When we have brains that are wired for fear and danger, and children living in a divided society where we separate them out at an early stage, we will inevitably get bigotry, homophobia, violence, hate, and suicide. But there's so much we can do there. If we can have peaceful minds, we can have a peaceful society. If we can intervene and treat mental illness and inform ourselves about the effects of trauma, we are building the solid foundations for peace and our imaginings for a better future for Northern Ireland can be realised. And that, everyone, is an idea worth sharing. Thank you. <laughs>